I'm Jen White. You're listening to the 1A Podcast, where we get to the heart of the story. There are over 40 million members of Gen Z eligible to vote this election. Over 8 million of them are first-time voters. That's according to research from Tufts University. This generation's voting power and influence are huge, so it's no surprise the presidential candidates are doing everything they can to get their attention. But what issues are really bringing Gen Z to the ballot box, and where are they getting their election information? Right now, we're teaming up with the On Our Minds podcast from PBS News Student Reporting Labs. It's a youth journalism training program hosted by two high school students and created with student journalists from around the country. This fall, it's releasing a special season focused on the 2024 election. Joining us is Risa Venturia from Minneapolis, Minnesota. She's a fact checker for the On Our Minds Election 2024 podcast. She's also a freshman at Columbia University. Risa, welcome to the program. Hi, thanks for having me here. I'm excited. Also with us is Grace Go from the Seattle, Washington area. She's a special correspondent for the On Our Minds Election 2024 podcast and also a freshman in college and joins us from France where she's currently studying abroad. Grace, welcome to 1A. Thank you so much for having me. Well, first, I'd love to get your reaction of what we just heard from Drew. How helpful or appealing do you think it is when you see a presidential candidate on your social media timeline or on a podcast? Grace, I'll come to you first. Yeah, I think it's a really multifaceted issue because it really depends on what social media platform you're on. For example, the content you'll see about the election on Instagram versus TikTok is very, very different. Me personally, I try to make sure my feed is only the things I like. So golf and puppies (laughs) and skiing. I really try hard not to make my feed um, have anything with politics on it, especially because the algorithms are so popular or powerful which means that, you know, you like one Donald Trump-related TikTok, and then in two minutes, you'll have 10 more. Um, And I'm not really sure how I feel about that. I definitely do not get my information from TikTok, but I can see why others do. It's so fast. It's so easy. um, And you can watch so many videos at once. I honestly don't really love it. Yeah. Risa, what about you? Yeah, absolutely. I actually find it find it really funny because I'm not a I'm not a huge TikTok or Instagram user, but I'll find that my friends that are on TikTok and Instagram more frequently, they'll actually be much more politically aware than I am because they get their news very, very quickly. Um, and they'll see like a 10 second clip on TikTok of something that's happening. For instance, I had like all my friends here talking about uh, Harris on the Caller Daddy podcast and how that was like such a huge thing with Gen Z and the effectiveness of it. And I, I didn't even know about it until I read it on like the New York Times. So it's kind of the fast bits of information can actually have a lot of advantages for this generation because they'll know exactly what's happening, but at the same time, the reliableness of the information can get a little bit a little bit tricky for us. Well, we got this message from Dave in Silver Spring who says influencers are not journalists, never have been, never will be. But as we've been hearing, social media influencers are playing a part in the election right now. Influencers like Jake Paul have thrown their weight behind former President Trump. Vice President Harris taped only three interviews at the Democratic National Convention, all with with influencers. So, Grace, how how powerful do you see influencers becoming within the political sphere? I definitely think that these influencers who have tens of millions of followers make a big impact. But in my opinion, I think it's kind of a lose-lose situation. If influencers stay quiet, they don't say anything about the election, then that seems really out of touch and their audience will get mad. But if they do publicly make a comment or endorse somebody, um, that could go downhill very fast. I think one thing to note is influencers are not like us. They don't live like 99% of Americans. They are going on these paid-for brand trips. They're living in a completely different tax bracket. And I don't think that those influencers you just mentioned are going through the same things that me and my family are going through. So while it does make a big impact, me personally, I don't take it very seriously. But it's interesting what you said there, that there's an expectation from these influencers' followings that they that they do certain things. So things. So how much of this is being driven by by the consumer side of the equation? 
I definitely think that audiences want to see their favorite celebrities or influencers or anyone on social media um, saying, I think everyone is saying this right now in order to remain neutral. It's the go out and vote. I don't care who you vote for. Just make sure you get to those polls. Um, It's a very easy thing to say, and I'm sure their PR team is doing an excellent job. Um, But I think influencers rely on consumers, which is why they have to do what keeps them happy. Well, Risa, you're a fact checker for the On Our Minds podcast, and in an upcoming episode, you provide some context on the topic of misinformation. Misinformation itself is usually described as the like false information inadvertently spread. I know there's disinformation, and that is false information with the purpose of being spread. Like in August, for example, there was like a flurry of fake AI generated images that showed how Taylor Swift fans were in huge support of President Trump and his policies. Recently, even Pew Research released a study that found that 77% of United States adults say companies like Facebook, X, formerly Twitter, TikTok, and Google have the responsibility to prevent the misuse of their platforms to influence the 2024 presidential election. That podcast episode of On Our Minds covering misinformation comes out on October 30th. But Risa, from your time as a fact checker and looking into election misinformation and disinformation for the podcast, what have you learned about both the importance and the challenges of seeking out facts for media consumers? Absolutely. Um, It's very... It's weird. It's a very convoluted topic because while it's both very easy, it's also very difficult to like actively seek out those sources that are going to kind of challenge your innate views. I think a lot of us, whether it's our generation or older generations, we're very comfortable in an echo chamber of things that we find relatable. I know Grace was talking about how the algorithm specifically feeds into the things um, that they believe that we find very political like politically likable and it can be really difficult to actively seek out different sources um that challenge those those perspectives and those point of views i know um in most recent debates there have been literal qr codes on our tvs that are telling us to hey go to this link you can fact check what is being said what is happening right now to basically use the very technology that is being weaponized right now to twist a lot of arguments and i think that's a really really powerful thing um, that people need to actively choose. It's more of an an innate choice uh, for individuals to want to be uncomfortable and to want to kind of take the extra step to challenge those facts. I know as a fact checker in the On Our Minds podcast, I mean, we go through like four or five rounds of double checking that everything that we record and everything that we say can be backed up by a reliable claim, a reliable source, something that isn't uh, biased. And sometimes we're going to come across claims that we say, and we just cannot find a reliable enough source to confirm it. So we end up just taking out the claim altogether. So we want to be really particular about um, including both bipartisan information, but also not um, kind of twisting certain arguments to appeal to different viewers. How concerned are you that, you mentioned the older generation of which I I am a part, but how concerned are you that your generation, which grew up with social media, may fall into mis or disinformation traps, Risa? I'm definitely scared (laughs) because, again, I I see myself, I'm at Columbia right now, and the, the environment that I'm in is very... It's very progressive. It's very um, liberal leaning. And there's a lot of individuals that I surround myself with that think very similar things to me. Um, So I'm not I'm not being continuously exposed to these these alternative ways of viewing um, different key policy issues. And that is really alarming because um, I'm not actively being uncomfortable, and it's so easy to just to stay in that box. Um, and it makes me really nervous because I'll see, you know, alternative viewpoints, and it, it's like be, we're becoming more and more polarized by the day. Um, and it's becoming kind of a hate that we see a, a immediately when somebody, you know, coins somebody as aligning with a certain party. Like there is this. Um, immediate animosity and immediate disregard for what they're bringing to the table. And that's, that's really scary. But do you make a distinction between, because I'm hearing two different things. One is about exposing yourself to other viewpoints, other perhaps policy perspectives, but then there, there is disinformation. There is misinformation. There's, there's information out there that is just demonstrably 
boss. So how are you how are you finding the balance between those two things? Absolutely. I think it's really important to actually combine both of those popular sources like TikTok, like Instagram, like those um, platforms that are going to give you information very quickly and information that's also very digestible. I mean, the way they do it is very strategic, like they're, they're reels and um, they have these like perfectly placed like dopamine hits for individuals to find really, really interesting. But with that, it's taking the time out to switch to an alternative app, to switch to something that, okay, this is a very interesting topic. How can I learn more information about it without accepting that, oh, I'm suddenly knowledgeable on, on what was just presented to me? Grace, why did you want to be involved in, in this project, the PBS News Project? I don't know. I'm just really into journalism and specifically like broadcast journalism. And I find that opportunities out there are usually for print journalism, like school newspapers and things like that. So when I saw this, I jumped on it. Risa, what about you? Yeah, I started in um, the student advisory team for student reporting labs. And from there, I got to know about the opportunity. And the whole reason kind of behind this off-spin season of On Our Minds with um, election coverage is to uh, produce digestible bits of information for our generation to take in. I think a lot of the time when we're reading the news, and I've struggled with this, like it's very complex, like mm-hmm. it's very complicated, and it it assumes that I know every little thing that's happened in American history or that I know all of like this, this, I don't know, that I know every single context all the time. And that can be so overwhelming. Like sometimes I'll open up a news story and I will get one minute in and I'll close it because I don't know what's going on. Mm. And it, it, it doesn't seem like it's making it... Um, um, accessible for me to understand what's going on. It's kind of like they're they're gatekeeping it from us. So when I when I heard about um, when the two individuals in our student advisor team presented this offspin idea of on our minds, I was very passionate about you know uh, producing this information for people in my generation to actually you know be able to understand, be able to digest, be able to um, communicate to their friends and family with, and feel like they're on the in of what's happening mm. in politics. I, I, I'm curious to hear about how each of you are feeling about casting a vote for the first time. And, Risa, you're from Minnesota, where Tim Walls is, is the governor. How are you thinking about that that first <laughs> vote this time around? Absolutely. I'm actually so hyped. Like, I didn't <laughs> think... I, I know that's, like, such a weird thing to say, but I am so hyped, like... I was so nervous. Like, I, my whole, my school um, in the suburbs of Minneapolis, like, there was this very, very heavy weight surrounding us for for kind of this past year impending this next election on who we were going to be deciding between. Um, And since uh, Harris entered and since the announcement of Walls, like, it has been this complete, like, optimism change of of what's next. And to be, to be, like, a young woman of color being able to, like, see another woman of color, like, potentially come into office is just, like, absolutely life-changing for myself. And I see it just setting a whole domino effect on what uh, policy is going to look like in the future. And, and I'm going to be so honest. I was so upset when I found out that Walls was going to be, was, um, was Harris's <laughs> vice presidential pick. I remember my dad called me, and I was like, no, because he's ours. <laughs> he is ours. And I was so sad because I love him, and he's done so much for us. Um, but uh, uh, but you're excited. Even, you're excited. I'm so so excited, well, and it's it's incredible. Well, Grace, what about you? I definitely see it as a responsibility, and like a responsibility that I'm taking very seriously. Um, since I'm from Washington, um, just to kind of give you a clue on who I'm voting for, I I don't think it'll do much. Um, I'm kind of the lone wolf, whether it's my community, my school, my family, my church community. Um, but I'm definitely still taking it with pride, and I'm excited. I know that maybe in four years, in eight years, I know my thoughts, my views will all change. So maybe this is something that I can look back on, and I'm going to make sure that I do my research well and just be a good American citizen. Well, I want to jump in here with a personal story, Grace, you tell on the podcast. And this episode explores what the U.S. means for different people. And so you decide to tackle that question for yourself. In many ways, my childhood has been pretty normal. I watched Sunday football with my dad, went to McDonald's anytime my mom would let me, 
and played with the neighborhood kids every weekend. But I've also moved schools nine times. Surprisingly, this didn't bother me a lot. I felt like I made friends easily and always looked forward to a new adventure. Yes, sometimes it was difficult, but the experiences have shaped who I am. But to this day, I still don't have an answer to why. Why did my parents make me move school so often? So I sat down with my mom and asked her. Even though we knew that moving to different school is hard on Grace, we decided to push forward to find a better education environment for her. So we moved quite a bit, uh, mainly for putting her better school district. So we are satisfied and grateful for the opportunities that we could provide for her. Grace, how did interviewing your mother change your perspective, if at all, on, on this country? I realized how lucky I am to be an American. I think in my generation especially, we're very critical of our country and the leaders, which we should be. Um, But I realized I'm so lucky to have the resources that I have and the opportunities that I have. And that's all because um, my parents came here and searched for a better life. And just so grateful. And I realized that even though my mom was born in Korea and she was raised there and went to school there, she also feels the same exact way. She feels as though um, she has opportunities here, or I guess I'm in France, so opportunities (laughs) in America um, that she wouldn't have had otherwise. And so with that background and that context from your mom, how are you thinking about education as an election issue this year? I, again, moved schools nine times. So I went to lots of different types of schools, public schools, immersion schools. And one year I went to a private school. And I think that education experience was the best that I've ever had. Even as I'm studying abroad in this beautiful country, France, I still look at that year and am just blown away by the resources that that school had. And I wish that every single student... um, in this country could have those same resources. And I don't know, it just breaks my heart to think that not everyone has those opportunities because that year really shaped who I am today and my interests. So yeah, I'm really thinking about um, equity in schools and um, you know, fighting for teachers' rights and making sure that teachers actually want to be there and things like that. Mm. Risa, what are some critical issues for you this election? Yeah, um, I would say being from Minneapolis, um, I know gun control is something that has become really, really important to us, especially since 2020, and being so surrounded by that as a community. So that is something that um, my whole community, as well as my family, find super important. Um, Being at Columbia now and um, October 7th, the anniversary of that was very heavy and a reminder of how important the Israel-Palestine crisis is right now um, for a lot of voters and a lot of individuals in my generation and how the action thereof taken towards um, that and de-escalating that crisis, uh, how important that is for voters, how important that is for myself, um, being kind of an observer to all of it is really, really difficult. So as well as reproductive rights, I know that's something uh, that has been like a very, very convoluted topic on um, in the debates and policy issues over these past few months. Um, but I find my friends and I um, really struggling with reproductive access, uh, even in New York City. And so it's 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 scary, um, especially since the overturn of Roe v. Wade. And we find it very important to kind of uh, get back to a society where that is still of substantial importance. I'm really curious to hear from from both of you whether you have spaces where you can talk about some of these issues, and not necessarily with just your peers, but with people from from other generations? Are, or are you finding that when it comes to politics, you kind of talk about them in, in that sort of closed group of friends that you may have? Grace, for you, do, do you have spaces where you can have these larger conversations? Actually, my church back home is the perfect space because we have 
tons of old people, um, so many different generations and people of different backgrounds. Um, And it's always fun to engage in topics um, like politics with them, of course, after the service has ended. (laughs) Um, But it's really cool to see how, um, you know, this one person, um, his name is Chick. He's 84 years old. And he is on the complete opposite side of the spectrum as me. So we like to get into debates and things like that. And honestly, because of our conversations, um, it's really helped me shift my point of view and um, think about things in a way that I never have. And it's so interesting that, you know, sitting down with my peers who maybe um, have uh, views that align with him, that won't do it for me. But hearing it from a grandpa, basically, um, really, I don't know. It really helped me kind of open up. Hmm. Risa, what about you? Do you have spaces for for cross-generational discussions about politics? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, My college has been really good about hosting those spaces for us. So they'll have roundtable discussions that go directly into kind of the uncomfortability of a lot of policies and we'll have um, a lot of older professors speaking um, at those and give a lot of nuance to certain policy issues that our generation like actively doesn't consider. And so I find myself coming out of those discussions very, very changed in my initial perspective about issues um, because of the experience that they offer um, and, and like very close absorption and observation of American democracy. Also to um, my father, I would say that he is, <laughs> we have, we do align politically, but he has been really good at like challenging the way that I go about issues and the way that I go about kind of um, considering alternative viewpoints. So sometimes we'll get into debates, even though we we seem like we're on the same side, um, he introduces alternative perspectives to get me thinking very critically, um, which has been very, very valuable to my growth as somebody that very much wants to contribute to this democracy in a positive way. Grace, what other issues are, are you and your peers prioritizing this election? What are you hearing? One thing that I mentioned in my episode was immigration, since both of my parents are immigrants. And I've been lucky enough to see their journey as, um, you know, when they were first time parents, I remember I was in kindergarten and they were having trouble kind of communicating with my teacher to my parents both becoming citizens, uh, which was five years ago and 10 years ago. And as a child of immigrants, I feel like it just holds a really special place in my heart. And I know that the system that we currently have in place makes it really difficult for people to um, go on the same journey that my parents did, which is why I'm concerned about issues like the southern border and like I just mentioned, the immigration process. I wonder if that's something other teens are thinking about because I know it's not exactly the most hot topic issue at the moment, but that's something that's been weighing on me. I mean, immigration has come up it came up heavily in in both the the presidential and vice presidential debates. But Risa, how much is it being discussed among your peers? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, it is still as heavy as those other topics. I mean, you asked, you know, what are we discussing? And I feel like I'm very grateful to be in an environment where we're discussing all of it. Um, I did mention gun control. I I mentioned the genocide in Gaza. I mentioned reproductive rights. But um, immigration and especially when it comes to asylum seekers and the homelessness crisis, even being directly here in New York City, um, that is such an important issue to... uh, the environment, the community, um, to educational systems. I think immigration is something that affects almost every institution in America and something that a lot of my peers and I uh, can agree on. So that is also something that we find of importance when we look towards this 2024 election. Really briefly, Grace, do you feel like your peers are motivated this election? Um, it's a little bit of helplessness and a little bit of we can do this. I definitely am biased because I'm Gen Z, but I think Gen Z is so powerful. And with social media, I know that uh, we're going to make a very big impact on this election. And Risa, I'll give you the last word. Yeah, absolutely. I think that we have seen with elections, uh, even in the past and with with the midterm elections, um, we have already had such a great impact. And I'm just excited to see our generation continuously to 
become those policymakers and eventually become in power. Um, and so I'm really excited for the turnout, and I have a lot of confidence in my generation. Well, that's Teresa Venturia, a fact checker for the On Our Minds Election 2024 podcast. She's a first year student at Columbia University and Grace Go, a special correspondent for the podcast and also a first year student in college. Risa, Grace, thanks so much. It was great to talk to you. Today's producer was Michelle Harvin. This program comes to you from WAMU, part of American University in Washington, distributed by NPR. I'm Jen White. Thanks for listening. And we'll talk more soon. This is 1A.